Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we'll be taking a look at how materiality assessments can inform your sustainability strategy and reporting. My name is Stephen Kennett and I look after the supply chain and energy and carbon management channels here at Two Degrees. I'm delighted to welcome our two presenters today. Joining us from PE International in the UK, we have Dr. Sandy Smith, who is stepping in for Paul Murphy, who unfortunately can't be with us. And from Canada, we have Jennifer Clipson, Senior Consultant and Sustainability Officer at PE International. Today's presentations will last for around 40 minutes, which will leave us with 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone that you can submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Just type in your question and press send, and then we'll wait till the end before answering as many as we can. As an aside, if you should have any technical issues during the webinar, please use the chat box on the right-hand side to send me a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over to Jennifer, who's going to get us started with today's webinar. So Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. And welcome to today's webinar. We're glad you could make it. We are going to spend some time introducing ourselves. Uh, then we'll talk briefly about some of the main trends and drivers we're seeing out there in terms of reporting. And with that, along comes that materiality assessment. We'll provide a brief overview of our SOFI 2014 tool, a new corporate sustainability software from PE. And then we're going to share a best practice case study in materiality assessment and reporting uh, from BASF. Of course, we'll leave lots of time for questions at the end, and we hope that uh, you'll jot those down as we're talking. So as um, Stephen mentioned, I'm Jen Klipsham. I'm a Senior Consultant and Sustainability Officer at PE. And Paul is not able to be with us today because he has no voice. <laughs> so Sandy Smith, my colleague, um, the Managing Director at, in the UK, is also going to be joining and sharing some of his insights and expertise as well. So a little bit about PE. Uh, we have over 20 years of experience working with 40% of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we have, we're experts in sustainability in both software and strategic consulting services. And we deliver the whole software spectrum from simple, ready-to-go solutions and apps to complex, configurable solutions that uh, allow your existing data systems to talk to, to each other. All of this helps our clients reduce their costs, lower their risks, and build stronger brands. So that is our mission, to enable organizations to succeed sustainably. All right, so now we're going to look at some of those general reporting trends and drivers that I mentioned. So the number of companies that we see reporting on environmental, social, economic, and governance performance, or as we hear, ESEG, uh, is growing. Last year, a record 72% of companies in the S&P 500 index filed sustainability reports, according to the Governance and Accountability Institute. Uh, that's up significantly, as you can see, from 53% in 2012 and 20% in 2011. Additionally, we're close to 2,500 companies submitted their 2012 sustainability reports to the Global Reporting Initiative, and likely many more follow those guidelines when developing their sustainability reports that the GRI isn't even aware of. So they're, they're using the principles and the disclosures of the GRI, but not necessarily submitting it to the GRI. The key message here is that sustainability reporting on sustainability performance <laughs> is is a trend that isn't going away. Companies of all sizes and sectors are reporting on their performance for stakeholders, and pressure from stakeholders like customers and investors, and even competitive pressure from peers uh, is growing. Now let's take a look at some investor interests that we're also seeing, uh, and the trend again is growing. 
Uh, so in the first graph here, you can see that in this research from the conference board, shareholder proposals for sustainability reporting grew from accounting for about 17.5%, this is the one second here from the bottom, uh, to 26.3% since 2009. So that's fairly significant. In this chart, a recent survey by PricewaterhouseCoopers of investors from the United Nations supported principles for responsible investment initiative showed that institutional investors are going to be increasingly looking for greater engagement with companies on ESEG issues. So most investors who identified sustainability issues as relevant say they're likely to have some form of direct communications with the companies in their portfolio about these issues in the next 12 months. And nearly 90% indicate that they'll be very likely to request information from the company in the form of a CSR or sustainability report or to complete a questionnaire of some form. So that's what here is in the first circle. Uh, more than two-thirds of these investors are also very likely to seek a meeting with the company's boards or management. And this third chart shows the ever-increasing trend in the number of investors requesting climate data through the CDP. Uh, just last week, there was an interesting news item uh, on September 25th. The Montreal Carbon Pledge was launched at the Principles for Responsible Investment Summit in Montreal. This pledge uh, will further mobilize investors to measure, disclose, and reduce their portfolio carbon footprints at the scale of hundreds of billions of dollars by the December 2015 UN Climate Change Conference. So clearly, we're seeing some growing investor interest, another trend that we don't think is going away. So although reporting is still primarily voluntary, the broad trend we're seeing is to greater disclosure. So these standards are all expanding, evolving, and increasing the level of transparency required from companies on a variety of topics. So the CDP, uh, formerly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project, administers an annual climate change questionnaire to public companies. Uh, since it was launched in 2000, it's brought it out to include disclosure of data not only related to climate, but water and forests. So it's growing in its scope. Uh, and in 2013, 1,000 U.S. companies disclosed through the CDP, including 334 companies from the S&P 500. So globally, 54% of the world market capital now discloses through CDP. Uh, in 2014, uh, we saw that the CDP is collecting disclosure data on behalf of 767 investors. So that equates to $92 trillion in assets through its climate change program. The second one here, Gresby, uh, it looks at environmental, social, and governance performance in the global commercial real estate sector. So private and public institutional investors are really looking to the findings of this annual survey as the barometer of sustainability performance in the commercial real estate sector. The GRI, or Global Reporting Initiative, has become the most widely used sustainability reporting standard in the world. And I'll talk a bit more about the GRI in the next three slides. But as many of you likely know, it continues to evolve with the G4 version that has come out. Um, so it, it's continuing to capture changing expectations of the stakeholders that are involved in shaping those guidelines. So the SASB, uh, it's an independent U.S.-based nonprofit that this that's developing sustainability accounting standards for use by publicly listed companies. Their aim is to really maximize sustainable value creation by identifying and reporting or disclosing information on the most material issues for their business. So SASB is using the U.S. Supreme Court definition of materiality, and their goal is to develop sector-specific standards for 80 plus industries by the middle of 2015. So they're moving really quickly. Um, they already have, I think, five or six standards completed in areas like transportation, healthcare, financials, non renewable resources. Uh, and yeah, the, like I said, the timeline is very fast and um, they have very strong goals of, of what they're coming out with next. So it's currently voluntary. 
Uh, but their aim is to get the SEC to adopt their standards, so the Securities and Exchange Commission. And we already know that the SEC has some sustainability-related reporting requirements, reporting on conflict minerals, as an example, reporting on health and safety. Um, so it's not that big of a stretch. So this is definitely one to watch. And you know, while it is a U.S.-based initiative, I think any company with operations in the U.S., uh, this is going to touch as, as it moves forward. The European Commission. So uh, companies listed on European exchanges are also likely going to be saying a bit more about their activities since a directive was passed earlier this year, uh, I think it was April, regar uh, requiring large businesses to provide details of their impact on society. So talking about um, their impact on the environment, on employee diversity and human rights in their annual reports. Uh, so this new directive requires um, disclosures from companies, all publicly traded companies with at least 500 employees. So the scale of that impact is that today in Europe, approximately 25 company, or 2,500 companies voluntarily produce sustainability reports, and this is going to rise to nearly 7,000 by 2017 when the law goes into effect. So again, a, a pretty significant driver there. And then the last one is an example of the proliferation of indices that we are seeing in terms of benchmarking the stocks of companies seen as sustainability leaders. So this is the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and it includes 2,500 of the largest public companies in the world reporting to it. So I think it's interesting to note that you know, there's these, these drivers, but we're also seeing some regulations on sustainability reporting popping up in countries like Norway, Denmark, uh, France, and South Africa. Um, and most of those regulations reference the GRI as the recommended reporting framework. Uh, and also in the UK, a recent legislation around carbon reporting for the companies listed on the FTSE uh, index. So let's talk a bit about the new GRI G4. Um, what's changed? How have expectations changed? <laughs> well, it's all about materiality. With the new guidelines, there's a much greater focus on this. And their goal is really to encourage companies to report less information overall, which might be a little counterintuitive when you take a look at the long list of disclosures in there. Uh, there's a lot more on value chain, on your governance, um, and how you manage that. Um, but really, as I said, their goal is to improve reporting by getting companies to report on only those issues that are material. So to reduce the burden on you as a company uh, so that you're not necessarily tracking 140 indicators and, and putting out a 200-page sustainability report that no one wants to read. Uh, so they're, they're really looking for you to talk about all the aspects you deem to be material, where they're material, so in which parts of your organization and where in the value chain, and then the process that you used to determine whether that issue or aspect was material or not. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking through their recommended process at a high level. So with step one, identification of relevant topics. So they're recommending that you start with uh, a list of all of the relevant aspects that could potentially be material to the company. So to put this list together, you could look to things uh, like the GRI list of disclosures, uh, any sector supplements that they've put out that would be relevant to your sector. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the SASB is coming out with sector-specific materiality maps, so that would be another great place to look to see if, if one has been put out for your sector. Uh, looking at what your competitors are talking about as their material issues. And then, you know, looking to other sources such as what your industry association is putting out as, as material or relevant sustainability issues in the, in the sector, how they're tackling those. So coming up with that long list, and, and they also recommend including stakeholders uh, in the identification of that list of aspects so that you're not, you're not overlooking something. So stakeholders that uh, would be somehow interested in or affected by your organization's impacts. So then step two, 
the materiality and prioritization piece. So taking a look at or an, analyzing that long list of aspects by assessing the significance to your stakeholders, your ex external to the organization, as well as significance to your company. So you'll want to develop a, a set of criteria that you would use to assess whether that aspect is material or not. So you would maybe think about things like whether the aspect is a significant concern in a particular region, or whether you're getting requests from any stakeholders for action, so some customer um, questionnaires or um, some investor questions. Um, is the aspect a subject of established concern within an expert community? So are certain academic or um, NGO campaigns targeting certain issues that are relevant for you? Um, so that, that would be whether they're significant to stakeholders. And then significance to the organization would be things like whether that aspect is a major topic or future challenge for the sector. Um, would your company have the ability to influence the performance of, um, well, your performance on that aspect, whether that's in your own facilities or even upstream or downstream. So even how you might be able to influence suppliers on those issues. And is that aspect likely to present a significant risk or opportunity for your business in the future, whether that's the short term or the long term? And this is where we see a lot of materiality maps, those matrices that you might have seen on some websites or in some reports. So companies are visually representing that, that rating. So how significant is it to stakeholders or to the company? Then step three is validating. So taking a look at what comes out of this exercise of the prioritizing or ranking and really thinking about, you know, does this look right to us? Are the aspects and how they, how they came out of this exercise of the materiality assessment, does that make sense for us? Is anything missing? Are those really the most significant aspects for us? Um, do they cover all of our impacts over the short and the long term? You know, do they take into account impacts within and outside our organization? So really involving senior leaders in, in talking about these results and what it means for the company. And then a gap assessment um, to think through, well, okay, once we've picked which are those issues that, you know, that, that did come out as being material for us, where are we doing things? Where are we doing well on these issues? And where are some areas where we might need some improvement? Uh, so that's that particular the gap assessment is particularly important for organizations using materiality assessment in terms of developing what's next, that strategy and action plan. So another big change with the GRIG4 is the change in boundary setting. And this we're finding to be pretty challenging for our clients. So now companies must consider not only the impacts within their organization, but also impacts throughout the value chain. So even if you don't have financial control over those bodies, you need to look at those. And as many of you probably know, you don't always know what's happening in your vendor's facilities with respect to environmental performance or human rights or labor rights. Um, you have little awareness or visibility on what's happening upstream. So you can see in this image here that this, the anti-corruption issue, um, this example, is showing that... Um, the potential risks here are really within two subsidiaries. And on this side with child labor, the risks um, that are apparent that came out of the exercise are really within a few suppliers. Um, and so th therefore, the company only has to report on the issue where it's material um, and can speak specifically to what they're doing to address the issue in these regions or these suppliers specifically. Maybe it's a certain sector or a certain product category or value chain. So this is really requiring companies to change how they think about their reach and potential and then how they're going to reflect that in their reporting. So some challenges that we're seeing with our clients, um, they're if you've, you know, if you've started your reporting program, these will not be new or surprising to you, I don't think. Uh, they're pretty common. Uh, the first one is really staying on top of changing expectations. So the scope of issues is broadening, which requires you know, ongoing monitoring. 
uh, with the G4, there, there's more indicators to consider and this expansion of responsibility throughout the value chain. Also, knowing how to engage stakeholders, how often, how to do that effectively, um, that's a challenge. And, um, you know, more is generally better, but that can be resource intensive. And so thinking through the process to most effectively get those insights from your external stakeholders is, is challenging. A lack of internal control. So uh, a lot of the clients we work with are, are sometimes working with multiple Excel files from, you know, dozens or even hundreds of facilities across the globe. And, they're, and we're trying to help them gather data um, f from those Excel files uh, or even different internal data management systems. So some information can be with HR, some information can be in legal, some is in finance, and so pulling all of that together um, is cumbersome and there's an increased likelihood for user error. On the data consistency and accuracy, again, that's um, be when many people are touching Excel files, uh, sometimes you know, they're reporting with different units or you're, they're using different emissions factors. Uh, and so that can, that can be a challenge <laughs> to compare and to ensure that everything is accurate, ac accurate and, and in the right format to roll up to a corporate number. Uh, changing the culture to embrace transparency. You know, many companies are risk adverse and they don't like to talk about any challenges or, or negative impacts that they might have. Um, and, you know, a lot of marketing departments still see reporting as a brand reputation management exercise. So uh, we're seeing that those kind of reports are becoming less credible and companies that, that openly talk about challenges that they've identified through the materiality assessment exercise and then talking about what they're doing to try to address those or partnering with other organizations to try to come up with solutions. Uh, those are the kind of reports and companies that are, are being seen as more credible. Uh, preparing different reports for different stakeholders. So we, we have clients that are getting asked by investors, by customers, um, by well, many different customers looking for different types of answers to different questionnaires. Um, this is challenging <laughs> in terms of the time it takes to put those together. Uh, and then this, the bottom one here, I think, the, the evaluating the business value and being clear on why you're doing it. So not just um, you know, investing a lot of time and resources together to pull information together without thinking through why you're doing that or what their, your main audience is, or how you can leverage this exercise of collecting data and information and, and, and managing that information um, in terms of setting priorities, assessing progress, um, you know, even the value of having this information available to communicate to your employees. Um, I read a study recently that more than half of S&P 500 companies you know, publish those reports, but their boards um, they don't. They vote against some of those, <clears throat> some of those proposals because they don't know. They don't see the value in it, and they think it's too resource intensive. <clears throat> so, really thinking through why you're doing it and what kind of value you can get from it, I think will help you, um, yeah, spend your time wisely. So, how to prepare for trends and drivers? Well, the best way we think to get ahead of the curve um, to be, you know, to ensure that you're able to provide data and information that stakeholders are asking you for, um, if they're not already, <laughs> is to integrate a materiality assessment exercise into your overall management process. Uh, so while the GRI and SASB are defining it differently, at the core they're all aiming to get the same result, encouraging more concise, more focused, uh, and shorter reports that um, you know, and the exercise itself helps you really understand what stakeholders care about the most internally and externally. Uh, it helps you focus your activities. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, instead of having a check the box exercise, trying to go through um, the GRI's list of disclosures and <clears throat> ensuring you have all 135 <laughs> 
noted in your report, um, you know, focusing on what matters most and where there's business value in addressing those. It's, you, you can't tackle everything at once. So where can you have the biggest impact? Uh, and so ensuring that you have a robust materiality assessment program in place will help you ensure that you're prioritizing actions in the strategy, which would be the next step, um, that really and clearly drive business value. So once you have those initial results from the materiality assessment, you, you go through your gap assessment, uh, you're probably doing some great things already, and then there's maybe some areas where you have gaps that um, they might be important, but how do you know? You go through a prioritization exercise based on business value, the business value conversation. You know, so are there particular risks your company is facing by not having practices in place in a certain area? Are you seeing you know, more customers asking for sustainability information about your product? like life cycle data or, some, or an EPD, um, or are they asking about your operations specifically or even your suppliers, and you can't respond? Uh, do your competitors have programs in place in areas that you don't, and they're really differentiating themselves in the market because of those? And those are the kind of conversations you would want to have uh, when you're looking at the results of the materiality exercise. And then once you've picked those priorities and formalized those in your strategy or refreshed your existing strategy, then, of course, you implement the strategy. The performance assessment piece, of course, critical, you know, reviewing progress against your plan, um, potentially evaluating whether you need a data management software to help you um, address some of those challenges I talked about earlier, um, and then reporting reporting on those. And that doesn't always mean, you know, putting out a downloadable PDF. It can be reporting interactively on your website and updating that information in real time. Uh, there's lots of ways to report as well. So that's how we think you can prepare. Now I'll turn it over to Sandy to talk a little bit about how um, a, soft, a software program can help you find efficiencies in your materiality assessment process and reporting activities. Thanks, Jen. Um, so a quick um, overview and then uh, Jennifer will come back on at the end and provide the wonderful case study of some work we did on materiality assessments with BASF. Um, so this um, slide that um, Paul's prepared, I think is, is quite apt. So Jen uh, presented graphs Ski jump, uh, ski jump graphs of the numbers of people uh, reporting, you know, going through the roof, the number of reporting uh, frameworks uh, increasing, the number of issues uh, environmental and social we're faced with uh, increasing, and obviously materiality is trying to put a cap on that particular aspect and, and focus it um, down. So I think in the conversations that we're having with clients and uh, internally in PE, sustainability reporting and materiality has come to a, a bit of a crossroads. Um, it's, it's grown very, very quickly and um, is, is continuing to grow. Um, and I think, I think the timing of this webinar and conversations on Two Degrees and, and other events is apt for us to take a, a moment of reflection and say, you know, what is the, what is the value of all this reporting? Have we got it, got it, got it right? Have we just um, jumped out there and starting spitting out um, information on every single KPI we could possibly think of? Uh, does it provide any any value to the business? Does it provide any value to sustainability? Uh, so I think it's important for us to kind of reflect on that now. And also, it's nice to see um, organisations like GRI and uh, SASB and CDP all, all, also considering that they need to work together. They need coordination and collaboration um, to make this work because we can't have multiple uh, reporting frameworks for the same uh, data. We need some. Um, coming together of this marketplace in terms of the issues reports, the standards that we uh, use, and the data of which we draw uh, our information from. And I'll come on and talk about the data um, in a little bit. Um, the other uh, aspect of the kind of growth is not only the growth in reporting standards, we're also having kind of growth in uh, materiality, materiality de defined in GRI, materiality defined in SASB. Um, if people have read the recent uh, relaunch of ISO 14001, the environmental management system that I'm sure many of you will have uh, in your organizations, materiality has even crept into um, that standard uh, now. So it is a phrase that is, is growing as quickly 
um, as the sustainability reporting disclosure frameworks um, and the methods to do it um, are growing um, as much as well. Our oh, quick, this is one of PE's favorite slides, uh, our sustainability maturity curve. Uh, um, I, I really just want to put on this slide and talk about where we think materiality is on this particular aspect. So clearly at the moment, uh, materiality is not associated with compliance. Uh, it's more in line with market driven than the engagement uh, activities over time. Yeah, it, it might move towards the compliance area. But I think organizations that are undertaking uh, materiality assessments are more in this middle to top end um, aspect of the sustainability uh, maturity curve. Uh, for those of you who have not seen the curve um, before, it's pretty safe, self explanatory, compliant at the one end um, with. Uh, less business value but nice and easy to do and then greater business value as you move uh, towards the right hand side of the curve. So three quick slides on our infomercial um, of, of Sophie. Uh, which is a sustainability software. So my proposition, of which you can completely shoot down and send in your questions and uh, disagree with it uh, in the Q&A, uh, I don't think that any organization, medium upwards, can manage materiality assessments, can manage the growing amount of sustainability uh, disclosure, can manage sustainability performance, um, uh, and can manage the, the data needs without software and specifically a sustainability piece of software. I don't think you can do it in Excel anymore. I think Excel is dead. That's my proposition that I, I put out to clients and uh, time and time again, um, I think it's showing to be true. Uh, there have been some fantastic Excel spreadsheets I've seen, mind-blowingly good, but as the complexity uh, increases um, and the costs of not going to a software increase, I think increasingly, I think uh, software will be a critical part uh, of how you manage uh, your materiality assessments. We'd love you to use our Sophie software, but uh, my proposition is that I think you need to look at a software. Our, our, our Sophie Sustainability software is a cloud-based software, won lots of uh, awards, Vedantec's highest scoring uh, environmental leader awards, but the, the key ones for me at the bottom, GRI 4 verified and CDP um, verified. Um, the data that I, I referred to before, um, within your organizations, you have the data somewhere uh, required to do your materiality assessments to find out what's significant, to disclose to these um, frameworks in some form of electronic uh, process. And then you have to disclose to um, different uh, standards, whether it be GRI or CDP or mandatory carbon reporting or, or, or whatever. Um, if you can get that data into a single source of truth, and then that data, uh, a click of a button, can spit out the information into the right disclosure format. It saves you a considerable amount of time, um, and it also saves you a significant amount of um, cost uh, going forward. Um, we have a number of offer offerings. We have the Enterprise Sustainability Solution, uh, which covers uh, a whole range of sustainability uh, aspects of business, health and safety, carbon management. Um, you can read uh, the slides. But I think the key ones that I want to focus on uh, that might be particular for this conversation is what we call our apps. Uh, very small bits of uh, software that do very specific aspects, which are really quite easy to do. So a CDP app, a GRI app, uh, and one that's quite interesting for this conversation is a Sophie Materiality Assessment app um, that will really help you um, support your materiality assessments and then go forward and help you rep uh, support, you know, if you're doing GRI or CDP reporting. Uh, and if you'd like to know more, please visit our website or, or give us a call uh, to continue those conversations. I'm going to hand back to um, Jen now, who's going to talk you through um, a materiality um, uh, piece of work we did with BASF. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. So a case study. <laughs> so as uh, we've been talking about, we're seeing more and more companies undertaking materiality assessments in order to minimize risks. Um, but the most valuable that we've um, that we see is if you also look at that through an opportunity lens. So how can the top issues 
that come out of that materiality assessment exercise translate into um, you know, product portfolio opportunities, continual improvement along the value chain, and other sources of value. So here's how BASF, um, a leading chemical company, has approached materiality with a continual improvement, cyclical type of process. Um, so they, they, they have an ongoing um, monitoring of emerging issues um, tool, mechanism, not a tool. It involves many different things. Um, they're always looking to identify and prioritize those issues. Which ones do they need to continue monitoring? Which ones do they need to react to? Uh, and then this kind of feeds into the materiality assessment exercise where they assess the relevance of, of what's coming out of one and two in terms of relevance for society and then relevance for their company. Uh, then it's you know really a strategic review of those priority issues and developing strategic options uh, to consider, you know, how are they going to address some of these priority areas? And then together, you know, with different business units, different business leaders, with external stakeholders as well, uh, selecting which of those prime options uh, they should implement to address any strategic issues, which really sets them apart and, and um, helps them position themselves in the market to be to not be reactive, but really proactive in how they're addressing any of those top issues. So note that materiality is one element of this. Um, it's really an ongoing activity. And they have other methods of tracking issues on an ongoing basis, which I think is important to point out. So they're regularly engaging customers on sustainability issues. They're engaging external stakeholders in an advisory council that meets a few times a year. Uh, they get involved in sustainable working groups on, on leading topics that are relevant for their sector. So there's there's many ways. I mean, doing a materiality assessment once a year or once every two years isn't, um, you know, things might come up <laughs> between that year or between those two years, and you want to make sure you're you're monitoring those and tracking those. So we supported BASF in this materiality assessment exercise to help them understand emerging global sustainability needs. Uh, together, we surveyed several hundred external stakeholders with um, expertise worldwide in different areas, uh, as well as engaging a number of specialists and managers within BASF. Uh, they, they all ranked the same 44 potentially material aspects in terms of their current and future relevance for the company. And this matrix that you see here shows how those issues came out in terms of that relevance. So the closer the issues are to the top right-hand corner, uh, that those ones were obviously more important to stakeholders and more material to BASF's business. And after uh, we did this, you know, after we uh, compiled the results of, the, we did some online surveys as well as some in-person interviews. Uh, and after we compiled those results, we met with different participants regionally to, to validate the results and really have some, some pointed conversations about whether um, this reflected their view, uh, whether they, would, they thought anything should be more important or less important, you know, those kind of questions. Uh, and as it turned out, the most material aspects for them were energy, climate change, water, renewable resources, uh, you see product stewardship here, human capital development, uh, human and labor rights, and biodiversity. Those were the ones that they felt were the most um, material or relevant to the company. Uh, so then they used those findings to inform their 2020 strategy and action plans. Um, they set clear goals around those highest priority issues. And of course, this informed the basis for their reporting. Uh, so this this you, if you go to their website, you can see a matrix like this. You can hover over the issues, and it will talk a little bit about you know, why that issue is material for them. And then how, um, if you click further, you can read more about what they're doing to address those issues. So BASF also breaks down the results of the survey by region to see whether there's significant differences and where there's similarities. So this, um, I think, 
is somewhat unique and somewhat leading. Well, very leading. Uh, this, slide, this slide here shows the top 15 emerging sustainability issues from the survey that we conducted. Uh, so these are the issues here on the left-hand side. Uh, and then they're ranked as ranked by survey respondents in each of the four regions, so North America, South America, Asia, and Europe. Uh, colored squares show areas of commonality, so issues that emerged as regional priorities. Um, and so you can see here that obviously energy and climate were, were common across all four regions. Uh, things like air pollution and unemployment were, were common issues uh, in, in three of the four regions. So again, another commonality. Uh, but then we began to see some differences. So concepts such as life cycle thinking and sustainable production and consumption were priorities in North America and Europe. Um, you know, signaling that a new way of thinking and understanding of sustainability is gaining traction in those regions. Um, things like ethics and governance uh, came out as an area needing greater attention in South America and Asia in order for sustainability to advance. Um, and other issues like waste and water pollution, land use seem to be unique to Asia and South America. So um, this is one example of the outputs and, and how you know, they consider the findings and really integrate those and into their regional programming on sustainability. But they also um, take it a step further in terms of um, looking at opportunities. So um, we have three examples here that we're going to talk about in terms of how they use the results of their assessment to reduce risk and maximize the, their opportunities. So on the climate side, um, they're look, they're you know, how, they're wondering how could they create value through an issue such as climate protection? Well, by creating products that they think help customers address this issue. So they took a life cycle approach to carbon footprinting that measured more than just their own operations. They looked at impacts and savings upstream and downstream. Uh, they've quantified that and then they communicate that to customers uh, and overall, you know, they are saying they've saved customers 330 million metric tons of CO2 equivalents through energy saving technologies in certain industries such as construction, automotive, and also through some specific solutions such as catalysts that remove NO2 emissions from manufacturing. So doing the work internally, but then communicating and putting together information to sell products to customers that helps their customers achieve sustainability goals as well and have an impact. So on the water side, um, you know, where one thing that emerged for them was the water energy nexus. Uh, so looking at um, you know, producing, processing, and transporting water all require energy. So with technical measures and um, looking at how to optimize operating methods such as pumping networks, uh, they've been able to reduce the specific energy of some of their cooling water supply at their own sites. Um, they've also, you know, because water is, is such an issue for you know, global sustainability, as well as their business and their products, they're joining strategic partnerships like the European Water Partnership. Um, they're also responding to the water disclosure piece of the CDP. Uh, so these kind of partnerships are helping them to improve their knowledge, share expertise with others, and really enhance their reputation and brand as a leader um, in this area. So when they're looking at product value on the water side, again, they're looking at how can we identify new product solutions that address water scarcity. So using some eco-efficiency analysis, they, they look at products and process emissions um, and in terms of the water use. And then um, within their portfolio, they're communicating which opportunities or products and services help to reduce both consumption of water or help ensure water sources are clean and safe. And then that's how they communicate that to their customers um, in terms of you know, sector specific, whether it's saving water in construction, certain concrete mixtures, or drought tolerant corn, or uh, a product, a, a portfolio of products used in applications ranging from municipal wastewater treatment to mining. 
So again, taking it to the next level of how can we develop products that we can communicate their sustainability benefits to our customer and then have our customers also benefit from, from those attributes. And then maybe one last example on the sustainable production and consumption side. Um, you know, they consider the full value chains from the raw materials to the end consumer and every step along the way. So they have some in-house tools, uh, something they call the sustainability check that um, their researchers use to, when they're exploring new technologies. And so with that check, they're looking at um, all the environmental benefits or impacts a new technology could create as compared with an existing alternative over the full life cycle of their deployment. So um, thinking about improving their pro product portfolio over time when they're coming out with the next generation of the product, comparing against a certain set of criteria, uh, and then using that to communicate those benefits to the market. So helping manufacturers and brand owners improve the sustainability of their products along the entire life cycle. So, you know, as we've seen, in addition to managing the risks, making sure they're on top of any emerging issue that might have a negative impact, they're really looking for opportunities to optimize their own operations, uh, demonstrate you know, that they're highly committed to these issues as leaders, and then bring solutions to the market that help solve some of these issues. So just one last slide here, uh, and then we'll go to some questions. So you um, might have seen this business value matrix if you've attended any other webinars um, with PE. But when we do materiality assessment exercises with our clients, you know, we do the initial surveys, the interviews, we come out with that initial visualization in the matrix. Um, and then we, we use this to help the clients talk through what actions they should prioritize based on business value. So will, will putting a supply chain assessment tool or questionnaire in place help you minimize your, your human rights risks? Maybe, to what degree? You know, how can we quantify that business value? Um, and so we use this matrix to facilitate that conversation um, and thought process that helps. Uh, and then we really try to quantify yeah, that, that piece. So putting some numbers, um, just back of the envelope type of numbers, or if they have real numbers too, um, that they've been able to gain somehow, that is always great. But often, you know, companies have real expertise in terms of how um, they think a sustainability practice would affect market share or would help to reduce turnover. Um, so helping to think this through and quantify those turns anecdotal stories sometimes into very strong stories. And those are the stories that are going to catch the attention from your senior leadership team uh, and other stakeholders. So um, we think BASF does a great job of this. And uh, yeah, we would encourage you to also make sure you're considering the business value of all of the outcomes of materiality assessment exercise and reporting before uh, just launching into that. So let's turn it over to, for some questions now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, so, yep, we'll go straight into the Q&A session now. Um, maybe you could want to pick up on, um, Jennifer, someone was asking about the BASF case study and the matrix that you developed. Um, how did they come up with the categories for that matrix? Uh, so those, uh, those 44 lists, the list of 44 aspects, um, we looked at, you know, their existing reporting activities. We looked at uh, the list of GRI uh, standard disclosures. Uh, we also looked at um, leading documents coming out, like Forum for the Future uh, puts out, you know, what are those, those, those top sustainability issues that we need to be aware of and um, trying to address as, as companies and organizations. So we looked at some of those leading documents um, as well. And um, I think those were the main sources that we, we used to, to create that list. Great. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, another question here is, how do you address concerns from legal departments who won't let a company use the word materiality due to its financial implications? 
and a complete and complete materiality matrix assessment. Uh, the person asking this question says, I heard you ah. a glo global U.S. publicly traded company only yesterday. <laughs> well, I, haven't, I haven't faced that yet with a client, but um, I guess to me that means they need some education about these trends and drivers and how that term is being used more and more um, you know, in GRI, in the Integrated Reporting Initiative, in SASB, you know, the SEC eventually will be using that term in a different way, I think. So, like, again, it's maybe getting some time with them to sit down and explain how, how it's really, the scope is expanding and changing on what's, what is material for a business. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, Sandy, question here um, for you. Um, is there any upcoming regulation to be aware of in terms of materiality which might drive compliance? I think it's a better question for um, um, Jen, to be honest with you, but I think the short answer is is, is no at the moment. Um, I think um, the most likely one that might go to a compliance-based activity is, is SARS in the, in the in the U.S., um, but I think mm -hmm. it will remain highly voluntary um, in, the, in the rest of the standards um, in terms of a legal compliance. But um, I think that the drivers in terms of the financial uh, drivers and also the business-to-business -business type um, drivers in, in some cases are kind of um, driving it forward to a point that, you know, there, are, there will become over time very few organizations uh, not doing this in reporting and therefore, the the requirement uh, for a piece of legislation would would not be there. So I think I think governments uh, are preferring a voluntary approach so far. I think if you look at the graphs of take up, it kind of looks okay in terms of you know that voluntary approach working. Thanks, Andy. Jen, did you want to add anything? Um, I think I think that was a good answer. I think. The SASB initiative has a lot of investor support. Uh, so again, it might, you know, if the SEC adopts it or not, um, the more investor support that that gains, the more stakeholders that get on board. Um, as Sandy mentioned, the drivers are going to come from other stakeholders. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. Um, Jennifer, an another question for you, which refers to the um, first part of the presentation. But... Um, uh, how should companies determine which external stakeholders to engage with um, mm -hmm. at the beginning? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the, the, you need to do a, a bit of a stakeholder mapping exercise. And I don't mean, it doesn't need to be very formal. <laughs> uh, it's just thinking through a set of questions about whether the stakeholder um, is directly impacted by you, whether they um, are loud <laughs> and are always coming to you with issues or questions. Um, yeah, there's a set of criteria, and actually the Global Reporting Initiative sets out some of those types of things to consider in terms of how to select companies uh, and do a bit of a stakeholder mapping exercise. Just one thing uh, to so add there. That would be a good start. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, one thing to add there, I think, is, is kind of... Um, the potential for NGO bias as well creeping into these materiality assessments. So, if you send out a questionnaire um, to you know 100 stakeholders, you'll get the most detailed response from issue groups and mm -hmm. NGOs. So you've got to have a process of um, making sure that the stakeholders are too busy or uh, perhaps um, have less of an uh, of a of a, of a drum to bang. Uh, are also uh, considered. So the issue of NGO bias or you know, single issue group bias in this materiality assessments, you can see it start creeping in in the in the in the results that you get back. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, another question, which has just come in. Um, somebody is asking. Bear with me. Does materiality assessment consider toxicological impacts, green chemicals, and chemicals of a hazardous nature? Uh, well, so the def what is material for your company will be different for every company, right? So if you're a company that makes products with lots of chemicals, whether they're 
yeah, if you're a company that makes those kind of products with inputs like that, then it is would be highly material for you. Um, so looking at you know, bio-based alternatives, looking at emerging regulations like REACH or California Prop 65, I mean, those kind of things are going to be heavily relevant uh, to and potential risks if you're not able to address those. So most definitely it would be material if you're a company that uses or produces something that goes into that sector as well. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Um, one final question. Um, obviously, you, you had the BASF case study there, but someone's asking, are there any companies you can recommend who are examples of good or best practice out there? Oh, for materiality. Um, I've seen a few recently in the food sector uh, that do a nice job of breaking down the results by value, the value chain. Um, so showing which, which, so instead of the matrix idea, it's kind of a different iteration of that that shows you know the different life cycle phases and then what the issue is and where they think it's most relevant. Um, so that. Uh, that's particularly relevant for that sector, I think, because a lot of their issues are are downstream or <laughs> so um or upstream sorry um, yeah i mean there's it's there's a lot of good examples out there i think and 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 companies are trying to come up with unique ways to present the results i think to differentiate themselves great, thanks Jennifer. Um, so that's all we've got time for for now, but I'd like to thank Sandy and Jennifer for their time today and for getting through so many questions, and also for everyone who's joined us for this webinar. Just to remind you all, the recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be archived on the Two Degrees platform, and as soon as this goes live, I'll send out an email with the link. So I hope you found today interesting and useful, and thanks again for joining us.